So, Mr. President, um, thank you very much for your address, and I think there was a lot in there that we can come back to on the economy. Um, but I think um, it would be useful at this point for me to ask you a few questions about Ukraine. <laughs> Obviously, Ukraine is going into presidential elections at the weekend. Um, an awful lot has been written and an awful lot has been said about your position on Ukraine, but let's be honest, most of it not by you. A lot of those who have written have said uh, you are nostalgic for a Russia of the past. President Obama said you are on the wrong side of history. Um, those who have written and spoken widely talk about you rebuilding the past and wanting to create a buffer state between NATO and the EU and yourself. Can I ask you, what has motivated your actions through this crisis? <clears throat> Well, I was planning to talk more about economy, but if that's what you desire, let us talk about this topic. Look, what happened? Let us make a general overview of what happened. Ukraine was supposed to sign an association agreement with the European Union. And we, using diplomatic movement ways, tried to prove that the document on the table was contrary to our interests here in Russia. We're referring to the close cooperation and economic ties we have with Ukraine. We look at defense industry, only 245 Ukrainian enterprises supply their products to Russia. What happens if we stop procuring from them? Well, they will have to stop production because we will not be procuring agents for the aid or our marine ships because no one else in the world needs them. And it's so difficult to enter the global market military components. And we proved using very specific data that this agreement would be detrimental to the economy. And I want you to understand, I want you to hear me. We suggested that they engage in a very civilized and open discussion with us to try and find some solution. We were told it is not of our business. I'm not trying to offend anyone, but I haven't seen such a snobbish attitude in years. They just refuse to talk, full stop, saying it's none of our business. Well, if it's, it is indeed none of our business, and we tried to prove to the Ukrainian partners that we had the point. We asked them to try and calculate implication consequences. I tried to convince President Yanukovych to postpone the signing. What happened later was coup d'etat. Name it what you may, but force was used, rebels were used. Who is on what side now? Who is in the past? Who is in the future? What tools are we using to attain our goals? One needs to be very careful and cautious with when dealing with constitutions and any changes or transformations in newly born state. What happened in Ukraine now is chaos. The country is sliding into chaos. Yanukovych agreed to do anything, whatever. Had it all been done legally, would continue subsidizing them, would keep gas prices low, would allocate the 15 billion we promised. And let us be frank, we're all grown-ups in this room, we're all smart and educated people. The West supported anti-constitutional coup d'etat, not just by giving away cookies, but by giving political support, supporting the media, using all sorts of tools. And are you blaming us? What we suggested was dialogue. We were denied. When I last came to Brussels, we agreed that dialogue would continue, but that was before the coup d'etat. And now Mr. Ulukayev, who sits opposite me, uh, he's a well-respected man, speaks decent English, by the way. 
He's got market economy way of thinking. He's one of our top economic experts. So Mr. Olikayev came to Kiev for a round of consultations. Well, ask him. No real discussion ever took place. They were just spitting out mottos. And now, what happens next? Coup d'etat took place. They refused to talk to us. So we think next step Ukraine is going to take, it's going to become NATO member for the past two decades. They refused to engage in any dialogue. We're saying military, NATO military infrastructure is approaching our border. Say not to worry, it has nothing to do with you. But tomorrow in Ukraine might become a NATO member, and the day after tomorrow, missile defense units of NATO could be deployed in this country. And again, they would say, we refuse to talk to you, it's none of your business. We're sick and tired of discussing in such a way because it's not a real discussion. Look, we have concerns, both economic and security concerns, for that matter. What are we supposed to do? People in the southeast of Ukraine, in Crimea in particular, were frightened by the development and people of the Crimea opted for a referendum on accession to Russia. All we did, we guaranteed freedom of expression of their will. And I'm sure you all agree, and the majority of people in this room and most people in the world, they understand because no one's stupid. Had we not done that in Crimea, the situation in Crimea would have been even worse than what happened in Odessa where people were burnt alive. No one's trying to give any explanation or condemn those who are to blame for their Odessa tragedy. Now you tell me who is stuck in the past and who is acting or take into account the realities of today's world. President Putin, I think, I think we've all been astonished at how quickly relations between apparent former friends have broken down as this crisis has escalated. There is an opportunity here for statesmanship. There is an opportunity for you to step up and say something. Is there something you can do at this stage or at this point to encourage pro-Russian groups in Ukraine now to reduce the level of tension and the violence to allow the democratic process to go ahead on Sunday and perhaps come back to a settlement or a resolution that would be acceptable to you? We believe and we always believed. I was and remain committed to the idea. We've been repeating this mantra over and over again. Any clashes end up in negotiations, eventually, inevitably. So the sooner the better. We always try to push opposing parties to engage in direct contacts. The first contact already took place through our mediation. Unfortunately, the situation is aggravated by the fact that Kiev authorities continue the punitive operation in southeast of Ukraine. Military action continues. They use an artillery, heavy equipment, um, armored vehicles, tanks. They shell presidential buildings. Civilians die. Unarmed people die. We do hope, and very sincerely so, that these direct contacts that were initiated will eventually yield some positive results. This is my true desire, but a condition for such positive outcome would be putting an end to violence, no matter from which side it originates. You said we're a room full of adults, so let's have a, an adult conversation. Um, President Obama has accused you, as you know, of untruths when it comes to supporting some of the separatist groups in the Ukraine. Who is he to judge? Who is he to judge? Seriously. If he wants to judge people, why don't he get a job in court somewhere? I don't think he accused me. It's his 
point of view. And I have my point of view when it comes to certain things, you know. What is it that interested you about what he said? Um, <laughs> President Putin, um, you appear to now accept um, that the election will take place on Sunday, at least. This is what I read, but as I said to you at the beginning, I read an awful lot about what you think, but I don't hear it from you necessarily directly. Um, can I ask you, just to put this on the record for our audience here, do you accept the legitimacy of the election that is going to play, take place on Sunday in Ukraine? Oh, come on, really? He's a difficult man to deal with. Where did you get the guy? We all understand and we all see that people in Ukraine want to see their country emerge from this protracted crisis. And we will have respect for the choice that the Ukrainian people will make. We will watch very closely what will happen, but it would be wiser to do what President Yanukovych and opposition agreed in Kyiv back on February 21st. And they agreed to hold a referendum, adopt a new constitution, and then, in accordance with this new constitution, elect parliament and president. Imagine election, presidential election takes place in Ukraine today. I don't know if you know that, but in accordance with the today's constitution, that would not be legitimate because Yanukovych remains president. He hasn't been withdrawn from power legitimately. So there are only four grounds, uh, either death, although some might have wanted him dead, illness, impeachment, no impeachment took place under the Constitution, and fourth, resignation. And the president is supposed to ask for resignation from parliament. So none of that happened. So according to the Constitution, he remains president. So why create new problems that would question the legitimacy of election? Wouldn't that be so much easier to hold referendum first, make sure rights of people in the south and the east are protected, explain, guarantee, give them guarantees for the protection of their legitimate rights. And after that, stage elections and get proper mandate and national support to rule the country. But those that are in power in Kiev today chose to do it differently. But I want to stress, we want to see some appeasement of the situation and we'll have every respect for the choice Ukrainian people will make. The front runner um, at the moment in the voting, I'm told, is uh, Mr. Poroshenko. Um, he's told CNBC that he would happily engage with Russia if elected. Um, is he a man that you could do business with uh, despite his desire for stronger ties to Western Europe? Where is the money? Where is the money, you know? It's a business forum. Let us be very specific. They owe us three and a half billion. Give us our money back. You know, that would create very good environment for further discussions. If you'll forgive me, Mr. President, if I have one more go on this before I move, move you on. But I'm not quite clear whether I heard you say that you will accept and work with the outcome of the election. Like I said, and I'm not kidding and I'm not being ironic, what we want for Ukraine is peace and calm. We want this country to recover from crisis, and conditions are to be created for that. We, and I'm, again, not being ironic. It's a sister nation, and we wanted to enjoy peace, order, and we already cooperate with people that are in power, and after election, of course, we will cooperate with the newly elect head of state. But just 
to make it clear, I hope that after the election, all military action stop and national dialogue will begin. Imagine, just imagine how can one engage in peaceful discussions while there are tanks shooting, shelling peaceful civilians or journalists being seized. Our journalists were detained and for three days now they've been kept somewhere. We don't know where we refused access to them. How can you call that proper environment for the election? We all see that this is not up to the modern democratic standards, but go help them. At least election happens. Can I, can I move you on to the international reaction? Uh, I think 2009, we were all very excited to see the reset in relations with the United States. Today, that reset lies in tatters. What went wrong? Well, it's the result of unilateral action. There are some U.S. allies with whom you can act in accordance with the principle if you're not with us, you're against us. You can create coalitions to justify certain actions, but this is not what we do in Russia. We believe that countries need to agree on certain rules, act in accordance with international law, take on board each other's interests. And in that sense, we always were and will always remain a reliable partner. Given the, um, the, the level of um, hostility, at least, that there seems to be played out in the international media, is there a road back in the relationship with President Obama and this current administration? We never did anything to ruin our relationship. And despite very rush rhetoric and opposing approaches to some very topical matters, our cooperation continues. Our American partners announced that they were they refused to cooperate in military domain. But look, did we really have any military cooperation? Well, we counted piracy. We're, continued, we're prepared to continue to do so, and our help is needed. Uh, Americans are interested in military transit to Afghanistan, still are. They say we are suspending military to military cooperation, but they're not suspending transits of military cargoes to Afghanistan because it's good, because this is something they need, and we don't refuse. We continue cooperation on the Iranian nuclear program. I just met Iranian president in Beijing on the sidelines of an international forum, and we spoke about further joint action involving Iran and taking on board U.S. position on the Iranian nuclear issue. Syria remains an important issue, and although our views diverge sometimes, we still hope we will come to some agreement. Uh, then we have common agenda and countering terrorism. This effort also continues. So we have many points of convergence that are of interest, both for Russia and the U.S. We're not trying to fence ourselves out from the world, but you can't force people to like you, as we say in Russia. But we hope that common sense, good sense, and national interests will push our European and American partners to continue cooperation with the United States. If I could, if I could just ask one more question on this situation now with Washington. Did, did President Obama misunderstand the depth of feeling in Russia about Ukraine and the situation there, or was the relationship already breaking down over things like the Snowden affair? Well, you know, 
with regard to Mr. Snowden, I said many times we do not have any direct relation to this problem. He turned out on our territory because of non-professional actions of the Americans themselves who tried to catch him. You know, I used to work for special services. Why should, why did they scare the entire world? They uh, uh, downed the planes with presidents on board and the plane with Snowden on board. They could down anywhere. So he arrives in our transit zone and then it, it turned out that nobody is going to accept him. That's the problem. If they didn't scare anyone, I mean the American Special Services, he would fly to some other countries, he would be downed uh, in some other countries, and he would be sitting in jail someplace. But they scared everyone. He stayed in our transit zone, and what are we to do in that situation? Russia is not a country that uh, that is ready to extradite fighters for human rights. And, but in reality, our reaction, well, thank you for this reaction on the part of the auditorium. Mr. Snowden considers that he is a champion of human rights. He built his life around it. He is a young man. I don't know how he's going to live further. I'm not trying to joke. How is he going to live further? He is sitting in Russia now. But he has chosen his fate himself. We, given, we gave him a refugee. He is not our agent. He didn't give us any secrets. Uh, we gave him a, a, a refuge, but he didn't tell us anything. He tells us something when he wants to publish um, something. As far as the rain is concerned, I think this is of vital importance for us. While for the U.S., these issues related to Ukraine were solved at the technical level, and I was involved personally, as many people sitting in this room, because for us it is of vital importance. For the U.S., it is different. But, you know, the general style should be such that we should have a direct dialogue, trusting each other, taking into account each other's interests. We are experts in following international relations. It is every day in the press. Every day we expressed concern about the expansion of NATO to the east, but nobody listened to us at all. They told us that any country can choose the, uh, the way of ensuring its security. Yes, it is, but why do they deprive us of the opportunity to evaluate the, these or that set of action from the point of view of our security? There are many ways to ensure your security. The United States may uh, enter into bilateral agreements and friendship and assistance, including military assistance. What is the difference between such an agreement and entering NATO? No difference. Of course, you can make members of the alliance to contribute to the general um, budget of the alliance, but they don't do those contributions anyway. Americans are trying to push them, but they, it, but it doesn't work well. The same happens with anti-missile defense. They're telling us all the time, this is not against you. President Medvedev, who did a lot in order to streamline the relations with the United States, it was his initiative. Let us sign a legal uh, paper which is worth nothing, that it is not against us. Just confirm what you say orally but they disagree entirely. What kind of dialogue it is, just general words and hot air. If we find our, you know, uh, force to take into account our mutual interests, but I'm an optimist, I'm not losing hope, and I'm not losing confidence that the situation with Ukraine will uh,
calm down sooner or later and we will find forces to streamline our relations. I'd like to move on to the economy and I'd like to talk a bit about um, the business conditions in Russia and how some of the sanctions that have been imposed from the West may be having an impact. And I'm pleased that we have with us a panel of international business people who work very closely with Russian companies and have their own investments here. So I'd like to involve them and I'd like them to feel comfortable also asking questions of you. Perhaps you can offer some guidance to them as to how they work here in Russia. Last year, a Angela Merkel sat on this stage with you. Um, she appeared to be a bulwark against um, sanctions driven mainly from Washington, and yet ultimately the sanctions were imposed. Today, many companies are wondering how they're going to get funding, what implications it has for the extension of credit from foreign banks. Can I just ask you very briefly, just to give us your thoughts on what the, the immediate impact has been so far on the sanctions that have taken place on the economy? You know, I've given you my vision of what was happening in Ukraine. What happened there, to a large extent, the responsibility is to be borne by our European and US partners who uh, supported this coup d'etat and uh, submerged this country in chaos. And now they want us to clean up for the mess they created. And this is the purpose of sanctions. But now all the sanctions are to pick up people from my immediate circle and as we say, and uh, punish them. On there, if I were them, I would uh, file a case in court a long time ago because they don't have any relations to the uh, events uh, in Ukraine or Crimea. And as always, they choose two Jews and one Ukrainian. Yes, they are my friends. I am proud of having such friends. They are absolutely uh, patriotically feeling people. Their business is orientated towards our country. Yes, of course, they felt the impact of those sanctions. We should be frank about that. It damaged them, but they are entrepreneurs with some experience. Uh, before the sanctions, they moved all their monies to Russia, so don't uh, be worried for them too much. But their businesses, of course, sustain certain damages. I think that this is unfair and unlawful, because sanctions can be imposed on a country at the decision of the uh, Council, uh, Security Council of the United Nations, and there is no such decisions. And in that sense, these sanctions are absolutely illegal, unlawful. And of course, they f decrease, uh, they make our relations worse. We are now hearing about the third package of sanctions, and I have a question in that regard. Why? Okay. They didn't like, our partners didn't like something about our, uh, at a certain stage in the development of the crisis with the Crimea. The sanctions were imposed. Now they're trying to make us to blame for something else. And they're saying that there will be a second package, a third package, and not, I don't understand why. Not long ago there was a, uh, uh, an earthquake in Thailand and people perished. Maybe we are to blame for that. But in Ukraine, civil war is breaking out. But what has does it have to do with us? This is uh, an attempt with uh, useless means. Of course, this this destabilizes the situation in our relations with the U.S. and the EU. But we. In the U.S., our trade turnover, we have a turnover of about $28 billion. In Europe, it is about 400. The difference is huge. And insisting upon sanctions in regard to Russia, 
I'm thinking that our U.S. American, uh, our U.S. friends want just to get certain competitive advantages in their relations with Europe. I don't see any other reasons behind that. That would be profound and serious. But I think that common sense will prevail and no uh, further damage will be made to our trade relations. But we are fulfilling whatever we need to fulfill. If we take the real damage, well, it does exist for the economy as a whole. How is it manifested? So that uh, access to resources for our com com companies has become more difficult, but it hasn't done uh, has made a significant systemic impact on our economy, and I hope it won't be the case. I'll ask our panelists to, to join us in this conversation. Khaldun, maybe I can start with you from your perspective. Uh, you run effectively an investment business. Um, what are the challenges now coming to the Russian market, not only because of some of the near-term sanction issues, but maybe some of the, the longer-term structural challenges as well? Well, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank President Putin for uh, his kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for organizing this forum. And uh, it's really wonderful to be in St. Petersburg in, uh, in May. Um, Russia is a very important market. And for us, uh, it is a market uh, that is very promising. We look at markets around the world. We look at areas and countries where we can invest sustainably for the long run. Uh, today, we have a focus on Russia. Why that? Why? because we believe in the fundamentals here. We have a great partnership that we've established here in Russia through uh, RDIF. Um, any country, any market we enter, we like to find partners that match uh, our skill set, uh, that match our, uh, our view in terms of how to operate, how to run businesses, how to invest. And we found that in RDIF. We found a, uh, an institution uh, that has uh, good governance, uh, a good management team, uh, a supervisory board, an advisory board that runs very well, uh, a high level of professionalism. We found a set of partners uh, from around the world, from China to Korea uh, to Japan, uh, Europe, uh, the Middle East, that are also uh, share with us uh, the same set of values. Uh, there's an integrity in the way this business is run. There's a belief in the opportunities uh, in Russia. And more importantly, we invest together dollar for dollar. And that's a very important thing for uh, an institution such as ourselves. Uh, we look at uh, investments from a risk-adjusted perspective. Uh, we have a, uh, a premise in terms of uh, having downside protection in terms of any investment we look at. These are all very attractive uh, fundamentals for us. And, and accordingly, Russia uh, and our partnership, uh, partnership with RDIF present an attractive uh, proposition to someone like Mubadala. Can I shift, bring you into this uh, conversation. Um, Sun Group has been in Russia, what, since 1958? It's a 112-year-old family business. Um, you have assets in Russia at this moment, but the tightening in liquidity that we've seen, sort of partly as a result of sanctions, but partly also, I think, as a, a longer-term structural issue of funding through the banking system here. To what extent um, is that hindering your ability to expand your operations or indeed to perhaps to sell assets that at this point in time don't fit your business mix? Thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank President Putin for having, uh, having me here. And it's wonderful to be in St. Petersburg. I am proud to say I was here for the first forum 18 years ago. And uh, it's really a wonderful thing to see how it's grown and developed into a major global platform uh, for discussion about a global agenda. In terms of our own business, um, we've been here since 58. I moved to Russia to live here in 1990. My father sent me here. I spent 22 years, years here. I have many friends here, and I'm very pleased. I feel partly Russian. Uh, and we have a business here. We've done various things over the years in various sectors. We have a mining business at the moment, a gold mining business in Chita, in Chitinsky Oblast. And uh, unfortunately, the current tightening in the global markets means that any financing that was going to come in from the West or from global investment sources 
has taken a much more cautious approach, not because of sanctions, but because I think of the threat of sanctions. And so there's a certain nervousness for people to enter this market. However, I think there are institutions in Russia, uh, Sberbank, VTB, VEB, great institutions that have been created in the last 15 years or so. And we believe that we will find solutions within the domestic context to continue with our financings and to continue to build the business. Thank you. Um, Frederick, um, Tilinor is invested in a telecom partnership effectively here. Um, you have been, again, in Russia for many years. Um, the company has long experience of this marketplace. Um, but I, again, I have to sort of raise the question with you. If you were to put money today into Russia as a foreign businessman, to what extent would that threat of sanctions issue be a deterrent? Or is it something else about the flow of capital out of the economy at the moment that would deter you? Or would indeed you feel happy to rush in? Also from me, thank you for the opportunity and yeah. also thank you for uh, uh, the frank speech from uh, Mr. Putin uh, on this occasion. And there have been other occasions as well that there have been uh, uh, issues to address. But Telenor has a long-standing relationship to Russia, um, and we are neighbors uh, in the geography, so uh, it, comes, it came natural when things started to happen here in the beginning of the 90s. So we did our first investment in 1992, uh, and today we hold roughly uh, a third, a little bit more, in Wimpocom. Um, and it's been a uh, a, a tremendous development in the economy over those 20, year, 20 years plus, no doubt about that. But how do we move from here? Uh, and of course, without this experience right now, uh, would we have done the same under these conditions? Maybe because we're neighbors, but also maybe not because of the underlying um, issues that were, uh, that were uh, so uh, well described by my colleague. So I think it's more a, a more difficult situation for newcomers. We are here, we have been here for many years, we are naturally taking business interest on how do we move from here. And my question to both the government and to President Putin would be uh, elements to which he referred to in, in your speech, namely how to put uh, the economy back in growth. How can the technology be used for that purpose? The digital economy is coming up at great speed. Uh, there are plenty of issues to that one, but there are also plenty of potentials, both for reforms to the economy and to put greater productivity into the economy. And aspects of that would, of course, be um, important to listen to. But we also have to be frank and understand that the situation in uh, Ukraine does need a negotiated, dialogued solution. And I hope that platform will be established as soon as possible and that we can move forward in that direction and be optimistic uh, in that direction. Okay, thank you very much for your comments. Um, Mr. President, I'll, I'll come back to you on this, if I might, because I'd just like to get Patrick to talk a little bit about the infrastructure side of what's going on. You referenced it many times in your presentation to us. Uh, Patrick Cron, of course, from Ulstom, um, a major engineering business in power and transport. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank you for the invitation, both to the panel as well as uh, participation into this great forum. I'm a regular participant, and uh, I find it year after year extremely fruitful. Um, yes, our company is involved in uh, infrastructure, power generation and transmission, and rail transportation. And uh, we are active in Russia through uh, localization plants and through uh, partnerships with uh, great partners. Uh, I come back to what has just been said. For me, there is a key element, obviously, which is the economic growth. We see currently, uh, it's not uh, Russian specific, uh, a slowdown in the economic growth. And in this uh, context, uh, usually, uh, unfortunately, uh, investments are cut or are armed. In your, in your speech, you mentioned uh, a number of large projects. And I would like to get your views on uh, what will be the policy in uh, infrastructure in general. This is a heavy industry, and uh, for economic actors to move, you need strong signals and some visibility. So I'd be happy to hear 
what will be, in spite of the constraints on budgets and spendings, the policy in uh, preparing the future. So if I could wrap those two questions together, Mr. President, and ask you just a comment. I have already uh, uh, mentioned those measures. I would like uh, not to repeat uh, myself. Uh, uh, I would like to stress the point. There are several problems at hand. Uh, two of those are very uh, serious. First, ensuring tempos of economic growth and changing of the structure of economy. Both things have been discussed uh, extensively at the expert level. It's very clear to us, and we mentioned it on several occasions. We have acknowledged the fact it's necessary to ensure the necessary tempos of uh, growth through augmenting, let's say, if we go that pathway. Uh, hydrocarbons uh, is not enough right now, uh, since uh, uh, now uh, consumers uh, like uh, 400 and a half uh, a billion of uh, cubic meters have been produced by Gazprom. Am I right? 460, okay. Now maybe 660, I don't know. Or we can do that, uh, quite possible to do that, to come to that level. It's necessary to ensure the necessary uh, tempos of growth. Uh, and uh, it's not possible to go only that pathway to that end, uh, like we did it uh, uh, earlier, uh, going up and up and up uh, uh, all the way. Like uh, the price goes that level, 108, 109 dollars per barrel, and uh, that's all fixed. Uh, that's all okie dokie. But uh, uh, we cannot uh, ensure tempos of growth uh, always through uh, broadening uh, sales. We need those systemic changes. Uh, we understand that only too well. Whatever I said today, eight nine points in my agenda today are aimed at primarily ensuring those structural changes. I don't need to repeat myself, I guess. Uh, I might do that, of course, if necessary. But uh, anyway, to be always at the edge of the problems, we have set up very good uh, uh, dialogue with our business community. We've been uh, meeting with them regularly. Uh, and the previous uh, government and the government in office have worked out mechanics of uh, regular context, whereby representatives of the business community would uh, be directly involved in preparation of uh, decisions, both at the legislative level and uh, bylaws involved. Uh, now, uh, entrepreneurship uh, as initiative I've referred to, uh, that's a uh, uh, reading, uh, reading of uh, uh, red tape, uh, be more uh, balanced. Uh, uh, now, uh, training personnel, that's our joint effort with the insurance community, and our business community are putting together proposals uh, for uh, now qualifications, upgrading. I've just mentioned that whole set of measures are aimed at that end. We hope that it will be implemented jointly with you, of course. Um, of course, we all know that you have just come back from uh, a trip to Shanghai, and um, you have signed, uh, while you were there, a significant gas contract with the Chinese government. So at this point, I'd like to invite on the stage Mr. Li Yuan Chao, the Chinese Vice President of the People's Republic of China. He is to come and address us. Sir, if I could ask you, please, to come up on stage. Um, if you could move to the end. This, of course, is a, a significant deal that runs over 30 years and has been, what, a decade in the negotiations. Sir, thank you very much. Please. Please. <coughs> <coughs> Your Excellency, President Vladimir Putin, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great pleasure to come to St. Petersburg, the beautiful northern Russian city, to attend the 18th St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. Entrusted by Chinese President Xi Jinping and also on behalf of the Chinese government, I wish to extend warm congratulations on the successful convening of the forum.
Since its inception, the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum has grown into an important platform for representatives of various countries to discuss ways of boosting world economic development, and China applauds the important role it has played in building consensus and promoting common development. Well, just now, President Putin has made a very excellent speech and also answered questions in a very eloquent way. That has left us a very deep impression. And China highly applauds the important role this platform has played in the international community. With the world economy in profound adjustment to realize global economic re recovery remains a challenging job for us. Therefore, the theme of the forum, namely sustaining confidence in a world undergoing transformation, is a highly relevant one. Here, I wish to address the issue of how countries in the world can meet challenges together in a world undergoing transformation and achieve common development. First, we should boost confidence through opening up and promote opening up with confidence. As economic globalization deepens, opening up is the sure way to prosperity and development. And the confidence is an important prerequisite for promoting opening up and the cooperation. After the Second World War, 13 economies in the world maintained rapid growth for over 20 years thanks to opening up to the rest of the world. What has happened shows that protectionism is the biggest obstacle standing in the way of world economic recovery. Chinese President Xi Jinping's call for jointly upholding and building an open world economy meets the development trend of the times. Countries should bear in mind the overall interests of the global family, stay committed to mutual opening up, oppose protectionism, deepen economic cooperation, build an integrated global market, and foster a world economic environment featuring order, openness, and fair competition. Second, we should promote innovation through reform and advance reform with innovation. Progress made in China's reform over the past 30 years and more shows that reform is the source of innovation. Reform has greatly sparked people's entrepreneurial drive for innovation. By closely following the trend of the times and promoting innovation in thinking, science and technology, as well as institutional building, we can set new requirements and goals for reform and instill reform with new vitality. Since the outbreak of the international financial crisis, the major economies have all taken reform and adjustment as important measures to achieve economic recovery and prosperity and prioritized scientific and technological innovation as a way to enhance industrial and economic competitiveness. Although the world economy is turning for the better, the economies still need to keep up the momentum of reform and innovation. All countries should strengthen macroeconomic policy coordination as well as their own reform endeavors. At the same time, we should promote reform of global economic governance mechanism so as to build a new global economic order that is fair, equitable, inclusive, balanced, dynamic, well-regulated, and stable. Third, we should pursue win-win progress through cooperation and promote cooperation with win-win progress. Cooperation is the natural choice for all countries to meet global challenges, and achieving win-win progress is what cooperation is all about. Only by producing win-win progress can cooperation last forever. In a world economy that is becoming increasingly integrated, we either rise or fall together. We should foster a stronger sense of community of common interests, focus on deepening long-term mutually beneficial cooperation, expand areas in which our interests converge and jointly make our common interests a bigger pie. By calling for the building of a Silk Road economic belt and a 21st century maritime Silk Road, China hopes to promote cooperation among countries involved in both scope and areas and at a higher level so as to deliver mutually beneficial outcomes and achieve common, uh, and achieve common development. Fourth, 
we should uphold development with peace and promote peace with development. This year marks the centenary of World War I and the 75th anniversary of World War II. History tells us that development is the foundation of peace, and peace is the guarantee of development. Upholding peace will, will boost the development and create a life of happiness for people of the whole world. All countries should pursue development as their primary, primary task and promote integrated, balanced, inclusive, and a sustainable growth of the global economy. We should be guided by a new thinking on security featuring mutual trust, mutual benefit, equality, and cooperation, properly manage differences, and settle disputes peacefully. By so doing, we can jointly create a sound environment for peaceful development. Just as President Putin pointed out in his speech that China-Russia economic cooperation is an important force driving the sustained and stable growth of the world economy. A few days ago, President Putin and President Xi Jinping had a successful meeting in Shanghai and they reached important agreement on comprehensively expanding and deepening cooperation between the two countries on the new circumstances. And uh, they have together raised China-Russia strategic and economic cooperation to a new level. The two sides will follow the goal set by the two presidents to deepen China-Russia strategic, strategic and economic cooperation and build a comprehensive strategic partnership of coordination featuring equality, trust, mutual support, common prosperity, and a lasting friendship. This will enable us to provide more positive energy to global peace and development. China is one of the key engines driving global economic reform and growth. China is carrying out all-around reform to achieve sustained and a sound growth. China's economy expanded by 7.7% in 2013 and 7.4% in the first quarter of this year. China has thus maintained a good momentum of steady economic growth. China's reform and the development have created an opportunity for the whole world. China will continue to champion peace, development, cooperation, and mutual benefit, and follow a win-win strategy of opening up. We will work with other countries to jointly meet challenges in a world undergoing transformation and create a new future of prosperity and development for the global economy. Thank you. 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 Я, я бы, я бы до, хотел добавить к выступлению нашего коллеги. Знаете, я за время работы в должности президента и председателя правительства много подписал документов и много присутствовал и присутствовал. And uh, I was present at signature of many documents over many years of my presidency and uh, being chairman of the government. Uh, so I'd like to add a couple of words here, if I may. But I don't remember a single case uh, uh, during these years uh, that we would have uh, signed uh, uh, not just uh, such a number of documents, uh, as it were, but documents with such a mighty content to it. And uh, indeed, I would uh, tend to agree with our Chinese colleague who had just said that even um, with a quite a high level of uh, Russia-China relationship, which you have enjoyed so far, signature of those uh, documents and agreements reached during this visit, in fact, uh, bring our relationship uh, with China at a higher and more quality level. And uh, by all means, we are thankful to our Chinese uh, um, partners and uh, Chairman Xi Jinping for his personal input in uh, tackling these questions. 
figures in your part of the world. It's an energy deal involving a great deal of infrastructure. Um, China is uh, an economy that also has, uh, if the Vice President will forgive me for saying so, some challenges at times with capital and allocating capital in the right places and creating the right opportunities for international business people to come and engage in operations. Could, could you just say a few words, perhaps, on how you see now the relationship between Russia and China and maybe some of the benefits for international business people like yourself who work in this sector? Well, I, I try to exercise our modest talents downstream, not really in, the, in, this, in this field, but uh, uh, you mentioned uh, China, we are very active in China, Russia, we try to be active in, in Russia as well. You know, sometimes it's it easy to do business. Uh, actually, the conclusion is the only countries where it's easy to do business are the countries in which you are not in. Everyone, uh, everywhere, it's, it's difficult to do business. You have to adapt to the reality. We have uh, strong challenges, a strong competition, etc. I agree with what was said in terms of protectionism. I think open markets is a must for the way we do business. We look for open markets. At the same time, we look for fair treatment. Uh, Mr. President mentioned that uh, in the development of infrastructure of Russia, uh, companies are welcome, whether they are foreign equity owned or whether they are domestic players. We are very happy to hear that. And uh, we, we try to, to do that uh, both in Russia and in China, but I hope that in spite of the high uh, level of commitments taken uh, in this visit, there will be still some opportunities for us, Mr. President. <laughs> well, I'd like to add also that um, those infrastructural plans and projects we've had uh, signed and uh, the need to develop infrastructure, like my colleague on the right has just mentioned, uh, and uh, citing figures, uh, they're quite substantial. Uh, investments of six and a half, uh, ten billion dollars worth of uh, necessarily will be in demand, and the technologies uh, and the experience of our partners as well. All of that is a good market uh, to do job, to use uh, your potential there. Now, as regards our plans um, with the uh, Republic of China. Uh, uh, living alone, yes, I have cited some figures there. The biggest. Uh, 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 construction to be done in uh, uh, that country, Gazprom, uh, 65 million, and a Galileo factory, uh, uh, gas uh, chemistry infrastructure to accompany it. Uh, of course, uh, with such a scale and scope, our partners uh, necessarily will find a, a job to do for themselves and to get some profit there as well. Your uh, presentation about um, opportunity and engagement, I think, in Asia. And I, I just want to continue this theme just a little bit more as we run down the group. Gentlemen, very quickly, because we're very close to wrapping up. But if I, I, I can start here um, and just get a, a, perhaps a, a few thoughts on India with a new government, the Asia opportunity as it comes to, to Europe in essence, and, and things change there. And maybe just run down the group and get a few comments. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to say about China. Uh, it's a great country, but mostly it's a great civilization. And I believe that China's growth um, is something that India very much admires. And I find that Russia, China, and India have a destiny, a common destiny together in Asia. and. Uh, when, however, thank you. however, I feel that, unfortunately, although we have a very strong political relationship between India and Russia, a very strong, strong strategic relationship between Russia and India, unfortunately, our trade relationship and our investment relationship doesn't match up to what it should. Uh, our relationship, just to give you an example, between India and China today is $80 billion of two-way trade. With Russia, it's less than $10 billion. Uh, that shouldn't be the case. We need a reset. And I think this is a great moment to do that. Uh, Mr. Modi, our new prime minister, uh, first of all, got a landslide mandate in India. And I think to 551 million people voted out of 800 million voters and asked for change, asked for growth, economic growth in our country. 
We still have 600 million people that are functionally illiterate. We have huge issues with water, with housing, with all kinds of other issues. Every year we add 20 million people to our country. Every seven years we create Russia in our country in terms of population. We need help, we need support, and we need to integrate globally in that. And I think Russia can play a very, very important role in that connection. Uh, how can we do that? I think we need to restructure and rethink about our engagement because evolution is not going to get us there. To go from 10 billion to 12 billion is not the solution. We need to find a way to go from 10 billion to 30 billion and from 30 billion to 100 billion over the next 10 years. And the question is, how do we do that? And I think that needs a reset. Thank you very much. Um, gentlemen, I apologize, but just can I get very few words from you? Um, if I can start with you, Jan Frederick. Yeah, you can get uh, a short one on India. I'm not the, um, the specialist on India, but we do have um, three billion US dollars played into telecoms in India as well, and that's more or less the size of the exposure to the Russian economy. And I think uh, Mr. Modi's coming has uh, created great expectations as to his ability to run through uh, economic reforms, which are highly needed in the direction that uh, was just mentioned. And the potential there is just phenomenal under the right structures and the right means. Thank you very much indeed for, for keeping it brief. And Caldu. Um, the Silk Road, historically, has always uh, been a route that kept us close to countries like China and India, historically. Today, as a trade relationship, uh, the UAE has a very strong relationship, trade-wise, with both India and China. Uh, of course, we'd like to strengthen these ties from a trade perspective with Russia, too. From an investment perspective, uh, we have been uh, traditionally conservative. Uh, we look at uh, investment platforms and countries where we can see a growth story, but also a risk-adjusted return. I, I repeat that again. We are trying hard in China. Uh, I think it'll be an area of growth for us, an area of a lot of potential uh, in the future. If you look at the next 20, 30, 40 years, especially for investors like us, long-term investors, we have to be in China, we have to be in India, and we have to be in Russia. India is a little bit more complicated because uh, the investment platform there, the investment, investment environment there is a bit more complicated, but we will keep trying, and, and hopefully with uh, partners like Shiv over here and others, we will uh, we'll be successful. So thank you very much indeed for that. So, so what I'd like to do here, I think traditional for us to throw forward and uh, be optimistic about the future and just talk about, about some of the larger themes. Um, so if we can wrap with that, Mr. President. When I was um, in Moscow in April speaking with Mr. Ulyakayov in the front row here, I also met with some young entrepreneurs, some young Russian business people who have been very excited about the last two decades of engagement with the global economy. And I have to say that they were a little down of heart and they saw what they thought was some of the unwinding of that interconnectedness that has taken place over the last two decades. I wonder if I could ask you, how, how does that damage get repaired if it is indeed damage? How do we prevent the rollback of what's perceived by the young business people in this room to be the engagement that now is rather stunted? I suppose we have to work together. We have to work together and to enhance our confidence and trust level. And that is why we are here today. The main logo of our forum is increasing trust. And we can only enhance our confidence and trust if we carry out negotiation processes taking into account legitimate interests of each other. And that is what Russia is going to do. That is the approach that Russia is going to take in this regard. And we hope for reciprocity on behalf of our partners. The, um, the, the young people of course inherit what we leave and um, my sense is from the ones that I've talked to here um, they aspire to the safety of a just legal system they um, want to have the freedom to criticize the government without retaliation and if that means the use of social media they also would like to use Facebook and Twitter and all these other things do you share these goals and ambitions for the young people mm -hmm. of Russia I 
I absolutely share those goals and objectives. I suppose this is one of our key priorities. I realize what you are trying to say. You are probably trying to say that we are trying to restrict the access to some websites. But we do not do that. We do not have any restri restrictions regarding the freedom of self-expression in the Internet. What I'd like to draw your attention to is the following. We've been criticized for the decisions that we've recently taken at the government level. We've heard all the criticisms and we already have relevant practices in place. We have introduced some restrictions and the restrictions only regard the ban on propaganda of pedophilia, child pornography. We have introduced ban on propaganda of ways of suicide. Excuse me, but all the legislation system of other countries envisage those bans, including European countries and the United States. And in some cases, bans in those countries are much tougher than in our legislation. I suppose that our legislation in this regard is a more liberal one. And excuse me again, but any society has to be able to protect the interests of its own children. And I suppose that people will just die if the children in the society are not protected. This is not a road that Russia would pursue. But at the same time, we're not going to introduce any restrictions regarding the volume of information or the types of information that could be provided for in the Internet. And we are definitely going to take every effort to provide for the freedom of self-expression in the Internet. At the moment, government is going to allocate finance for speed internet access, even in the very far villages of the Russian Federation. What I'm trying to say is that we are taking practical measures in order to enable everyone in Russia to use modern technologies. You'll forgive me just for asking one more, because we have obviously seen, and this is what our panel is ultimately about, how we steer a path through what has been a troubled period of time for the planet, and we have seen in many occasions where there have been difficulties, social networks getting closed down or banned. And they have become, like I suppose the telephone was for my generation, the way that people communicate today. So no ban on Facebook, no ban on Twitter, no ban on the Russian equivalents, regardless of what's on them. Uh, First, we are not going to shut down any social networks or websites. Second, we are not in any right to criticize those who do that. I suppose that in that every situation is unique and it is not for us to judge what is just and what is not. Anyway, we are not planning to implement that practice. What we are planning to do is to develop the modern communication tools. And I do hope that we will never return to the era where the Kalashnikov machine gun will be the main communication tool. Mr. President, can I ask you then just to share with us your global view, if you like, how you see the world as it stands currently, the trends, the opportunities, the challenges. Do you mean the industrial areas, the communication area, or, you know, our communication minister could probably share that with you. He could do that better than I could. <laughs> but if you are referring to the fact that some bloggers are equal to the mass media, then that's a different thing. Are you trying to say that? You can be very straightforward with me then this practice is employed in some countries, like, for example, in Great Britain and the Federal Federative Republic of Germany and in the United States. And there's nothing special about, there's just a gap in our legislation that we are trying to cover for. And the implementation of those norms is not in contradiction with any international trends. I should rephrase my question. It really wasn't a question about technology at all. In fact, what I'm asking as we come to the close, really, of this session, is just to give us a statesman's view of how you see uh, the world developing from here. You talked a lot in your speech about the, the tensions between the old world order, the new world order, the 
connection with Asia and other G20 economies, the challenge of what was a G8 now being a G7, and I don't know where Russia, whether Russia attends the next meeting coming up, for, but there are so many big issues that I think it would be useful to get your worldview on, if you could just share with us. You know, that's quite a complex task. I suppose that could be the theme of a separate forum, and it could be a theme of a separate panel, I believe. But in general, I'd like to express a hope that in spite, in spite some acute issues that arise from time to time in this or that part of the world, the human kind is going to be sensible enough and will be able to draw lessons from the past, from the previous millennia, including the lessons from the tragic events that have been mentioned by our Chinese colleagues. Soon we are going to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Second World War, and we also celebrated the anniversary of the end of the First World War. What I'm trying to say is that the peaceful negotiation process is always the best solution for any problem, and all the legitimate interests should be taken into consideration. So let me wrap up here, thanking you once again for having us here, as, uh, you, you know, inviting us uh, to be your guests. And if you could just leave our business community with a message before we wrap things up. My message is very, very simple. My message is very simple, and this is as follows. Think of your own profit and benefits related to your potential possibilities of work in the Russian Federation. Do not submit to blackmailing. Pursue your own road, and you'll definitely succeed. We will help you. Gentlemen, the present president of the Russian Federation. I have and I would like to express my gratitude to our moderator. I don't know what your specialization is, what area you're professional in. On the one hand, you're a very scary person, and on the other hand, you're a person who has managed to create a very business-like atmosphere and a very constructive atmosphere during our panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.